welcome to another Way of the Brush Conversations. This week, this is episode five. This week, I am joined by Tim, a.k.a. Knackchack. So here he is. Yep, that's the wrong screen. There we go. Now we got the right screen. <laughs> Knackchack, Tim, hello, sir. How hey. are you this fine Saturday? Oh, I'm good. I'm good, yeah. It's, good? Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Knackchack... Uh, right. Uh, I'm going to call you Tim because I'm, I mean, I'm yeah. sure, you, I don't know. Does anybody in the real world call you Knackchack or is that just the strictly your online handle? Um, not anymore. Not anymore. No. Many years ago, but I've had this handle for dial up days and I never would use Yahoo. So. <laughs> right. Now, is that, is that your gamer handle? Like, do you play games as well with that handle? Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere, basically games, um, forums everywhere, Knackchack. So. <laughs> So I could, I could do, so I could do a good Google search on Knackchack and it'll just all point to you. Pretty much, I think. There's a couple of imposters, but <laughs> okay. And the handle Knackchack. How the heck do you come up with a name like that? Uh, blame my parents for my cat. It um, jumped on the keyboard many, many years ago, sort of mid nineties, and it kind of stuck. And yeah, so I thought, go with it. <laughs> and so you were typing something, and then the cat ran across, and it was just Knackchack came yeah. up. Yeah, and you love and you loved it, of course, right? Well, it sounded good at the time, and then uh, yeah, it all worked. So. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you know, you know what my online handle was for a long time back in the day. What was that? Crazy talk. <laughs> From the Simpsons episode. Yeah. Uh, ah, it's crazy talk. No, no, that's my brother. Crazy talk. <laughs> Native American thing. I, anybody who's familiar with that episode, I don't even know what episode that was, but. Anyway, <laughs> I still kind of go by crazy talk every once in a while, but yeah. Anywho, so how are you? You're well. And yeah. uh, work gaming, um, painting. How long have you been painting? Um, oh, painting miniatures and toy soldiers from about the age of seven, but that's without any real ability or accomplishment. Um, sort of played a lot of war games when I was a teenager and then the free bees happened so that was beer, birds and bills and uh, that sort of led to about a 10 year hiatus between buying or playing anything and uh, coming back to it about 18 months ago so uh, yeah played a fair bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you've been a lifelong war gamer like myself yeah. and many many of us out there and there's a few, few people out there who are relatively new and you know they're you know they he, and it they hear a lot of us old timers, you know, go on about, you know, the good old days, like when you could get, you know, three rhinos in a box or 30 space yeah. marines in a box. And uh, I mean, I've, I've still got dreads made out of lead. Yeah. Dread, they, yeah. They are, they are lead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lead. Uh, I have yeah. a great unclean one that's lead. So, yeah. Weighs a bit. <laughs> Think of a base either. <laughs> now, your painting level, uh, or like you know, how, how you perceive your painting level. Um, I don't know. I'd say enthusiastic. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a master at anything, but I've well, got a certain I, level of. Skill I don't consider myself a master of anything either. But better than nothing. It's, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess it's one of those ones done it, painted for. for I say, got to be getting on for. 20 years off and on so you pick stuff up over time but you know I, I still wouldn't consider myself an artist and I still can't ever work out the magic shade to make things look just right yeah <laughs> it's, uh, well do you get do you get to spend a lot of time uh with your hobby uh, as much as I can humanly fit in really it's uh say juggling fatherhood and full-time work as well it's all a bit of a nightmare and the company I work for is just come out of um, startup cloaking mode, so we're uh, very, very busy at the moment. So, yeah. but every time I get a spare five minutes or a particularly boring conference call, I tend to <laughs> do bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're you're pretty much you're pretty much the norm as far as everybody's wargaming ability and painting and time they get, especially for a lot of us older guys who you know do have families. And you mentioned you had you had uh, a little girl. Yeah, yeah, a little girl, just yeah. just the one. Just the one, yeah. yeah. She's, she's more than enough for the time being. So. <laughs> how uh, how old? Um, four and a half months. So oh, she's so she's just a baby. 
Yeah, and she's oh, uh, quite a handful already. So. Yeah. No, but honestly, though, cherish those moments. Oh, um, we do. We do. So. Yeah, because soon enough she's going to be talking, and then you're, you're just you're not going to be able to stop her talking. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's all downhill from there. <laughs> my master plans to have a shed at that point so I can have a sanctuary somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I can see on your shelves you got like a whole bunch of boxes up there. You got some Epic going on up there, yeah, some second edition yeah. 40K. Now, are those things... Are they, are they, are they, um, like, are all the components still in there, or are they just there yeah. and bits are inside them? Bit, bits and pieces, um, certainly most of Epic's still in its box, uh, you've got Gorka Morka above it as well, uh, that was a great game which nobody seems to play anymore, Yeah, but that was, uh, that was too much fun, um, yeah, I got, um, yeah, I've also got the new, the new Space Hulk and, uh, Death Storm, so that's kind of fun. Dark Millennium when we have to buy the expansion to get Psychers. Uh, so that's pretty, I'd say probably is about 20 years worth of uh, Games Workshop history on one shelf. So. And I, I also like that you got some Iron Maiden on the walls. That's oh, yeah. that's that's a proper little man <laughs> cave. If I ever saw one, when I uh, when I still had my all my painting stuff in my basement and previously in Northern Ontario, uh, I had the a big uh, mounted. Uh, piece, uh, the trooper, and I had the last one. Um, oh my god, matter of time. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Where they're all sitting on the uh, T ninety. Yeah, yeah. I have I had that big wall, wooden wall piece as well. Nice. I mean, I've actually got a uh, reissued Made in England uh, picture discs sitting next to the uh, Games Workshop boxes, but that's currently up there. Need to find more space to hang it. <laughs> I, I, see, I see a bunch of wire on your walls as well, like hanging from the shelf there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you can't see it from this angle, but the other side of the room is uh, basically my electronics lab. Oh, okay. Um, which, so I've got oscilloscopes and power supplies and all sorts of uh, crazy stuff going on. Now, <laughs> now, is, that, is that another hobby for you? It is, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know, I seem to be really attracted to working with really, really small things. <laughs> so yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we all have our and I like it, foibles. So. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and so, a hobby like that, electronics. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people out there, you know, like everybody, we all love our wargaming, but we all have another hobby, uh, you know, as a side thing. And obviously, I would say yours is probably electronics. Um, and I, I'm left to assume that you've probably built every PC in your house. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. much every PC. And uh, yeah, I mentioned some of few servers, and because I build phone networks for a living, I've also got a ridiculously over the top home phone network and it's all too much to just acquire it <laughs> now with with your electronics knowledge uh have you ever gotten into putting the led lights into models or anything like that i've i've looked at it i mean i've um again i say so i basically had a, a sort of 10 year 10 to 12 year gap i guess where i think of halfway through third edition when i kind of lost interest or found other things to do and yeah, come back and there's all these sort of crazy things going on. So I haven't done it yet, but I definitely will be doing it. I'm also strongly considering trying to build like a radio controlled um, stomper of some description, something orcish and radio controlled. I think would be <laughs> like excellent. an orky battle wagon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I like I like building orc vehicles. I mean, I tried collecting them and it just got fed up painting green. But the vehicles, I, I love the aesthetics of the vehicles they've got. Uh, just slap it together and. Uh, have some more and have some more. Uh, yeah, you you could, you could definitely see like an orc war buggy being like an RC car with the big mutters on them and you know, just kind of tramping around. That'd actually be yeah. really fun. <laughs> it is. I mean, I've actually I'm not sure if I've got it in this room, but I've uh, I've got a ridiculously big um, truck I built for Gorkamorka because one of the rules in Gorkamorka was if you could basically they made modding vehicles part of the rules saying if you can. Yeah. fit a man on it or fit some uh, gubbins and scrap on it it you know you can play it and the whole point of the game was to collect scrap and fight each other so yeah i ended up building basically concept was a freebooter land ship so i ended up um making a custom um freebooter captain um model to drive the land ship but the land ship actually had a standard orc driver with some uh string coming down to his hand so he was being controlled by a big ship's wheel from the top deck and so I then built it out as a ship so it had 
the top <laughs> deck and the lower deck and big outriggers on the side. So I think. Go ahead, I've got some pictures. I've got some pictures, so I'll, I'll have to see if I can find the. Uh, yes. many I don't think it's in this room though. Uh, but I mean, bonus of Atlas also, it was nearly entirely built out of leftover sprue and uh, bits of balsa wood, <laughs> so it really did look cobbled together. Yeah, because if you could, if you got pictures, send them to me, because then I can include them in this video. Yeah, I'll, um, yeah. I'll, I'll send those over. I'll, yeah. Uh, a few pictures I've taken already, actually. So. Des <laughs> describing the land ship, I'm, uh, the first thing I'm thinking is time bandits. And... Yeah, it was similar to that, but a bit <laughs> rustier. And, <laughs> and, uh, it was, uh, it, yeah, it worked pretty well. It was big, which was uh, always an advantage. I think I ended up managing to fit just shy of um, 30 boys on it. So, yeah, it was uh, pretty good. I know a trailer, of course. You know, every land ship needs a trailer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that worked out well, yeah. And so, did you have any kind of uh, question for me or anything like that? Uh, well, um, first thing that springs to mind is, is, is there any good way of breaking in new dry brushes? Because my dry brushes, I had some red-handled dry brushes from way back when, and uh, yeah, they just really weren't, they fell apart when I looked at them, but the glue had dried out in the bristles and everything just fell out, so I was just like, yeah, this is no good. So I've gone and bought some of the new um, black-handled Citadel dry brushes. I just can't seem to get them to have the paint stick to them as well as a well broken in dry brush yeah that um because i think i think you did send me a message or i seen that mm. in a chat at one point i think maybe you sent me an email on this um but yeah briefly may have left it as a quick tip comment oh is it a quick tip comment yeah Could have been, yeah <laughs> yeah i i know i i, I as soon as you started talking about this, I knew I had seen it. I didn't know if I addressed it or not. But, yeah, breaking in uh, a brush, like a dry brush, because typically, you know, and I was talking today uh, on Way of the Brush about this, um, you know, keeping your dry brush brush separate from the rest yeah. of your brushes, right? And typically the dry brush brush, I keep, that's getting harder to say, but um, typically it's an older brush. And, you know, when you buy a brush brand new, for the intention of dry brushing, yeah, you kind of do have to break it in. And really, I um, getting the paint to adhere to the bristles, like to getting them to stay in the brush, the really nice quality. Uh, with the with the GW one, I found that, like, you know, the first time out, I, I didn't really have any problems with it because if you look at it, they, they almost like uh, razor the hairs. So they're almost like split ends. They've almost like basically beaten up the end of that brush already yeah. when they sell it to you, right? And yeah, the only thing I can think of is just um, like apply the paint to the brush. Uh, typically, I use like an old rag, uh, an old t-shirt, whatever. And that's what I wipe the paint off with. Wipe it off, you know, very, very liberally. And then just, you know, uh, work it against, like you know, like a test model or something like that. Uh, until the brush starts, you know, flowing how you like. Uh, of course, you know, with dry brushing, it's always it's always key to maintain a very light hand when dry brushing, right? Yeah. And, you know, so when you really want to beat up on that brush, the other one is uh, I, I find that after I've, because I wash my brushes, my even my dry brushing brushes, mm. I wash them in the soap. Uh, to clean them because oftentimes when you are working with, say for example, I was working with Mephiston Red, I was dry brushing with that, and I'm going to switch to you know uh, a flesh color or a blue or something like that. I will yeah. wash the brush before moving to that next color because I don't want any transference because dry brushing will beat that color into the bristles, and that will transfer when you go to use another color. And so I always wash the brush, and oftentimes whenever I've washed the brush in the soap. And the bristles want to stick together like, you know, like a good brush does. I find that I will whap the end of the brush on the end of the corner of the table. And I'll just to kind of, you know, beat the hairs a bit and, you know, kind of get them going again. Like a good dry brush, right? Because it's kind of like a, the end of like a feather duster kind of thing, right? Where the hairs are just yeah. kind of going all over the place. That's a good dry brush because, again, the hairs are just kind of going all over the place. But, yeah, as far as, um, you know, buying a brand new one and getting it worked in yeah it's just kind of one of those things where you just kind of have to work it in um even another one is say for example like a piece of terrain that you're working on yeah. where there's lots of surface and you know you work on your you know your your back and forth type motions and also your semi-circular type motions right with the brush and you should eventually you know build the color in uh or uh, where the hairs 
so that you know they start retaining more and more color as you're working but yeah i've never really thought of uh you know um deliberately beating the crap out of the brush for dry brushing because typically all my brushes you know they all have a life cycle even though you know i'm trying to take care of them and stuff like that you know just invariably you'll have a life cycle to your brush and you know they get demoted as as the years go by and you know like I've had, I've, I've got like large wash brushes that are my dry brushing brushes just because, you know, they're no longer good wash yeah. brushes. I mean, speaking of brush life cycle, I mean, I'm pretty sure I should retire this one. I'm not sure how well it's showing up, but <laughs> yeah, it's perhaps a millimeter or two of left of the bristles <laughs> on the end. It's... Yeah. Well, you know what though, but don't throw it out though. Yeah. Um, because those brushes there, I use that kind of brush for like when I'm applying the PVA glue to the base. I'll use yeah. that brush. Um, if, um, you know, say for example, you're trying out a different kind of paint, one of the, like the solvent based paints. Now I, I don't recommend using your sable hair brushes to do that. Definitely recommend, you know, having synthetics on hand for that kind of work. But yeah, uh, as far as dry brushing though, yeah, it's, it's kind of just beat up on the brush. Typically though, I mean like that, the, the way the Games Workshop sells that, la that larger dry brush, or yeah. the medium dry brush, I think, which is, whichever one it is. Uh, it, they, they, it looks like they razor the hairs and they give it a, a, a taper, like a rounded taper around yeah. that end. And, yeah, that's that's just so that it, it already has that kind of beaten feeling. But, yeah, it, it, it'll, it, it's just a new brush. And, unfortunately, the dry brushing technique, it just works really well with an old beat-up brush than it does yeah. with a new brush. I think that's... Basically, the problem that the brushes I was dry brushing with they were so beaten up, so they literally fell apart. But I haven't looked at them for probably a decade. So <laughs> yeah, well, I was I was using the newer, uh, the small dry brush, and I knocked the furl right off that. The yeah. glue let go. I don't know if, if I was being too rough or if it was just a you know a lapse in quality control. But yeah, the furl uh, fell off from the handle. As I was dry brushing, I was like, what the hell? And then, so I grabbed some glue and, you know, stuck it back on there. And Yeah. I, mean, I, would, I would say sort of having such a sort of decade gap between what Games Workshop and Citadel have released, but the size of the new fine detail brush compared to the old one. The old one, the new ones are like two sizes up. Yeah. So it's, it's mad. I was sort of, wow. <laughs> wasn't yeah. expecting that. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd imagine, you know, I don't think they, they stick with the same brush maker, right? Because, you know... No. As... Well, no, they, they feel totally different. I say, I've, I've still got plenty of, I say, the, the very old red-handled ones, and yeah, they the... weigh... The weight is so wrong in them compared to the new ones. <laughs> yeah, the red-handled <laughs> ones, yeah, the red-handled ones are heavier, and the sable was softer, and uh, the blue ones, they felt lighter, but the sable was still really soft, and then these new black ones, yeah, the the the, um, the handles feel really light, but the the sable feels stiff. It almost yeah. feels like they've got it's a sable blend of um, almost like hog hair. If you've ever seen like the hog hair brushes where they're really really coarse bristle, yeah, they almost feel like that at times. Because I know, brush. yeah, because I know my detail brush. It seems like you know, um, it, it can be really firm at times if you're pushing too far onto the mm -hmm. bristles. But, you know, that's it's just the nature of it. Because, I mean, like, some people prefer a firmer bristle as opposed to a softer bristle. Um, when we're working with the paint in really diluted fashion, we prefer a softer bristle, like a really soft bristle. But when you're working with, say, for example, you're blending, you probably want a, a firmer bristle because you want to be able to move that pigment around on the surface, right? Versus the softer bristle is just kind of more like a you know wet mop kind of just pushing the color around and it's not really doing the job. It's you know it's not being forceful enough. I guess is really kind of where I'm going yeah. with that idea. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cool. So nice. So yeah, I say the other thing I've been uh, playing with recently is uh, hairbrushes. I got one for Christmas. It's a uh, clone. Um, Clone of a, a water, I think. Yeah, uh, that's what it looks. That's what it looks pretty like. Pretty nifty, though. I mean, this, this eBay 
Chinese knockoff made in the same factory. Apparently, the parts are compatible from the expensive brand to that brand. And uh, I think the kit it came in, um, it was a kit, the hose and everything was about, uh, I think, about forty dollars. So pretty cheap, but pretty yeah. good so far. Um, but I say it's, I don't know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been fun trying the whole new sort of discipline. I've obviously had spray cans of primer and base coat, but actually laying colours down and playing with them in a different way has been a lot of fun, but it's also led to me making a lot of uh, accessories um, for it. I think the other week I sent an email to Way of a Brush with the uh, little blob of green stuff I'd uh, fashioned mm. into a, a fake yeah. finger yeah, yeah, yeah. to mix in the, uh, in the cap. That was, uh, yeah. that was good fun. But my, uh, <laughs> my latest invention is the uh, spray bottle, so I can uh, clean into that one, <laughs> which has uh, been made out of an old baby bottle's teat, um, so we can... Avoid getting all the vapor coming back out. Oh, I, okay. So I see. I see. So you you push the airbrush into the, right into the nipple. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So. Uh, yeah, that's actually that pretty clever. Uh, I like that. And, uh, I like that. I saw I saw things for sale which you know they were what fifteen twenty quid and I was like back for a pot with a seal on it. The, so uh, look now, at the rubbish I'm about to throw out. <laughs> now when you're using that overspray. You're, you're taking the cap off, right? Yeah. Okay. Because typically, like, I'll, I'll show you my little homemade overspray bottle. Oh, you can't see it, but I'll show it anyway on the camera here. <laughs> okay. Um, it's an old bottle for uh, Woodland Scenics, where they sell, like, their static grass, stuff like that. Yeah. And I simply just cut a little hole out of the top. But out of the cap of the lid, it already had, uh, like, salt and pepper. You know, like, it has the yeah. uh, perforated top to it. And I took the uh, sponge from the blister packs, you know, that gray sponge we get in all those little model oh, yeah. packs and stuff like that. And I put that into the cap and scre re-screwed the cap on to act as a bit of an air filter. And so I was, I was looking at your bottle there and I would definitely recommend that as having some sort of filter on the top because as you spray into that bottle, the, um, the vaporized material will carry out through the top and you can't, like, you, you, you shouldn't leave the cap down or anything like that because otherwise you're just going to build up pressure in there right and then yeah. the end up going to it's going to end up spraying back at you through that nipple so you need a, you need that pressure to go somewhere and i definitely would uh, put some sort of uh, filter on that top of that bottle just so that it catches most of that material um and, and it's not going into the air or anything like that and especially if you got little babies around you know yeah you don't want that kind of crap floating around in your air too long that's a really good idea. I'll, uh, I'll add that onto it. I think that's uh, yeah. got some foam. Yeah, um, I just add some foam, you know, and just and have that perforated top. Yeah, see, you got tons of that crap, right? Yeah. Every, all, I think all of us modelers, we all have tons of that foam sitting there. Oh, I've got so much stuff. So. Like, I, I've used that foam so many times in, like, quick tips and stuff like that, and I'm, I'm always kind of, like, describing alternate sources for it. But yeah. I think most gamers, we all have it anyway in our collections of garbage and so... I mean, speaking of alternative sources, corkboard, I found, I don't know if it's about the rest of the world, but in the UK, you can get, um, very well, you can see that, that's an Ikea um, placemat. <laughs> yeah, a packet of, um, they're quite big, I've cut half of that one up, actually, it's a uh, full-size one. <laughs> nice. You get a packet of four for one pound, so that's basically would probably cost a dollar. Yeah, one, well, one, one pound, uh, one British pound is like two dollars Canadian. Yeah, but that's a little good. over two dollars, I think, Canadian. Nice stuff. It's quite flexible and pretty, uh, pretty fine on the brain. So that's, uh, works yeah. out really well for me. That's, uh... Well, usually I find mine at the uh, dollar store, and it's usually like um, for like the pit backings of like picture frames and stuff like that. And they'll have like the cork backing, and you, know, you just scavenge that. I also I use it's... the panes of glass for pallets and you know things like that. I mean, it's, it's strange. Things like that seem to cost an absolute fortune over here, but other stuff, which seems to cost a fortune elsewhere, doesn't. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it, it's got to be those importing fees, right? Something like that, it must be. I mean, I don't know. Like here, picture frames work, but they tend not to have cork in the back. So. <laughs> but anyway. And uh, so it's uh, interesting ones, what you can uh, find and do. Cause, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really into trying to not spend a fortune where I can avoid it for all sorts of reasons, partly because it's just generally a rip-off uh, for some, some items. It's, uh, well, I don't know. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I, I still can't believe people actually buy the Citadel water pot, for example. I mean, The Citadel what? 
Uh, they, they sell a water pot. Oh, the water pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clean your brushes in. Well. Or the pallet. Yeah. And, oh, and apparently oh, now there's a wet pallet. Pallet liners. Yeah. Pallet liners they sell, which are sheets, um, greaseproof paper, baking parchment. Yeah. Um, it's like they'll, they'll send you 10 sheets for a low, low price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. But, Just because yeah. it's got that GW logo on it, right? I mean, put a skull on it and add, uh, well... Add a hundred to whatever the price is, multiply by a hundred. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I think I'd think them to uh, do with my new um, well, a new, new toy was the uh, baby's bottle warmer. You know, you get these electric warmers for yeah. you basically a water bath. Well, they get really hot. I mean, I, I measured how hot they got, and they got to about 79 degrees to 82 degrees C, um, which is plenty hot enough for actually straightening bent resin in. Really, so you can just plonk it in there. And leave it for five minutes to come to temperature, and it's a lot easier than using boiling water in a saucer. Yeah, because you can you can just have a little bit of aluminium mesh, which I think most modelers should have on hand anyway. <laughs> yeah. Car repair stuff, you know, it's great. Yeah, you can build anything, you know, turn it into razor wire, whatever. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but you know, you've got that on hand. Build a little cradle to put your piece in. Um, say you've got a forge wheeled um, rhino door or something like that, then come out a little bit bent. <clears throat> Put it in your water bath, turn the heat up, give it five minutes, and it's soft as. You can just bend it straight back into shape, and uh, away you go. But it's good, because they say you don't have to have the kettle on hand or anything to put the boiling water in. Just turn it on five minutes later, and you're good to go. Yeah. Like, normally for resin, like, I don't work with the boiling water, but I, I let the hot water run, and I leave the part under the hot water. Yeah. Um you know, versus like, because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of like submerging the entire piece into, uh, you know, the water because it'll uniformly warm the piece. Uh, but usually whenever, uh, like, for example, like uh, the Eldar Pulsar lasers, right? They're big, long lance-like shaped things, right? And typically you only need to warm an area to bend the entire piece versus if the entire bit was warmed, then I'm dealing with this big wet noodle kind of thing. Versus where it just I want it, just the temperature to warm up at a specific point, but I but I like the, I like that like the bottle warmer. That's mm. now how uh, how big a tray is that? Um, it's probably about three inches round, three inch diameter on it. Oh, okay, so it's quite quite big and about four inches deep. So you can I say if you use some aluminium mesh, you can just partially submerge. Yeah, get it. I mean the other thing which I find really useful as an electronic tool for uh, heating. Um, I'll try and show this on camera. So you see that? It's basically a miniature um, paint stripping gun. It's got a uh, two, three millimeter tip on it. Yeah. With adjustable airflow. So you can actually have it. It's designed for, if you ever look at it, modern circuit boards, you've got all those um, little black dots that look like fly crap. Yeah. Um, it's designed for heating those up individually and removing them. So when you're talking about components which are 0.6 of a millimetre in size, um, it's perfect for that because it's such a localised bit of heat. I mean, it's also really good for um, just altering the pose of arms and stuff because you can have the heat so, so uh, focused on the miniature for literally a couple of seconds and it's got a massive adjustable heat range from I, about I, 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 100 I, degrees C to... I really like that. Send me a link for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll um, see what I can scare up. I like that. That's 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 a good tip. It's it's, it's so useful because it's, it's just such a fine focus control in the air as well. Yeah. That you can just, just heat it just enough so not so it starts warping and deforming, but so the plastic becomes malleable. And yeah, a little bit of gentle pressure. It's like working with lead almost with a pair of <laughs> now, bending how, the arms back into shape <laughs> or out of shape depending on your point of view. How small and how small a control area would you? Could you get? Could you say, for example, bend a Space Marine's leg, like at the yeah. knee joint? You could warm just that knee joint and bend the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, easily. Um, I mean, the actual focus of air, it from, depending on how close, because because you can turn the airflow so low down on it that you, if you put your hand in front of it, you can't feel the, the pressure of it. I mean, you can put it in front of a piece of paper, and it only just flutters in the breeze from it. Um, so you can get in really up close and really really close with it to be honest um i say but it's designed the tool itself is designed for working with surface mount electronics yeah i so, like that um, and if they're actually really cheap they have about 40 50 us dollars on um ebay so huh. you're not talking bank breaking amounts of money either here for specialist tools but yeah but i mean no. it's one 
every time I've seen a sort of video, um, and that's something else which is different, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, <laughs> every time I've seen a sort of video of somebody who's got a paint stripping gun and they just want to like bubble some PVA glue or speed up the dry, and I'm like, you're using the wrong tool. What are you trying to do? You know, you're trying to blow it to the moon. <laughs> you know, use that. You've got control of the heat and you've got control of the airflow, so you're not going to destroy anything. Yeah, uh, no, I really like that. That's that's an excellent super nifty. Super yeah, nifty that's an tool. that's an excellent tip, man. I mean, at the same time, also, I'd recommend buying electronic side cutters, not hobby shop side cutters. Um, simple yep. reason being, good electronic side cutters, they've got an extra little spring. Yeah. There on the side, but they really do do have um, really fine tips to them, and can get in really flat finish on them. So when you're cutting off the sprue. I've yet to find anything Games Workshop manufacturers where the moulding is too tight to get those in and do it. But again, because they're electronics tools and they're not marketed as hobby tools, they cost a fraction of what the hobby shops charge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that pair there was about five pounds, five British pounds, and that was, yeah, pretty cheap for what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, oh yeah, well, because everybody's looking to make a buck, right? And so... Now the thing is, is that if we, if <laughs> if you make that little um, uh, hot air device there popular, guaranteed other people will brand it, and this is perfect for drying your models while you're you know you're glazing the model and working out. It is. It's it's, it's better than a hair dryer in my opinion because it's a bit hotter, so it's a bit quicker. But yeah, <laughs> so, no, but again, I, I like that. The airflow is just the best bit because otherwise, you know, so I say. It was a very big culture shock to me to discover that all of a sudden plastic was the amazing casting medium and people looked down on metal minis. When back in the day, it was like, oh, plastic's rubbish. You want metal, you know. Yeah. You can't get the quality of casting like you can in lead. All right? <laughs> so <laughs> now it's gone fully full circle. It's like, yeah. well, resin's rubbish. You want plastic. <laughs> so, which is, uh, oh, that was quite a... A weird one to sort of realise I've really missed out on a lot in sort of the 10, 12 years I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but, my the game. but 10 years, over 10 years, there was, you know, there was rumours that Games Workshop, they they wanted to move their entire range to plastic. Yeah. They wanted everything in plastic. And so now we're getting to that point now where everything is plastic in Games Workshop. And, you know, I mean, we the information was out there, you know, ages ago that, you know, that yeah. was the move they wanted to make. And now we're finally seeing it, right? So I've still got some white dwarfs from the mid-90s when they moved over to white metal as opposed to the lead-based stuff mm -hmm. for health and safety. And then all the sort of uh, exaggerations on, oh, this will improve the casting process and this will do that. And yet, oh, we've also increased the prices. Yeah. Oh, right, so you use a cheaper material and it costs us more. Right. <laughs> <So it's, laughs> that's something's never changed. Or, or the uh, whole fine casting too. Casting yeah, and resin. I think I... Think I got that just at the end of all that so it's, uh... <laughs> uh that one was kind of overblown the whole fine cast thing it's just yeah. because people you know they just weren't used to working with resin you know anybody who's worked with like forge world resin i mean it was no biggie working with fine cast it was nothing big deal yeah. in fact it was a lot softer uh, kind of dangerously soft but like in the fact that you could probably rip details off a model very easily or break a model very easily you know but, I mean, the thing was light as air, you know? Like, the model had, like, no weight to it. Like, the base was heavier than the model. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I guess the only thing I can think of comparable to that was that for a while I spent a lot of time building um, scale tanks. And there were a couple of Italian manufacturers who used a very, very lightweight resin, which, yeah, it was different to work with compared to the usual sort of hard plastic, hard expanded polystyrene of some description. That's, yeah, uh, yeah. That was good stuff, but yeah, so it's uh, I am enjoying the uh, the change to the new stuff because I mean, certainly, uh, we building up um, Captain Carl from uh, Deathstorm, um, at the moment, and just the details they've added to what was essentially a standard Terminator. It's like, wow, that is actually really cool, and I couldn't imagine that being done in metal, <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, no, and it, it really it is the it's the whole uh, computer CAD. Uh, yeah. process that they've really kind of mastered now and now I even mean, all the sculpting is done in CAD and it's, it's amazing to me when I look at something as simple as the instructions before we used to have an exploded 
photo, um, you know, of the arrows connecting. Now you can clearly see it's all CAD designs, and you're like, they've even made the CAD, well, CAD renderings look like the old style photos, <laughs> which is, I think, quite yeah. charming. So. <laughs> I mean, that's I was thinking of this actually. There's, have you got any tips for uh, dealing with like, a misalignment in the um, the cloak? There's on um, Captain Carl, whatever his full name is from uh, Deathstorm, the the cloak comes in two pieces, and I've got a better photo of this, but um, I'm not sure if you can see there's basically a misalignment between the two joins on the um, on the cloak, and just wondering any nice way I can deal with that, because it looks to me like that's probably going to really stick out when it's painted. When, when the... Uh, now, is it the parts were misaligned, or... It was in the process, like in the molding process. There the was part... a huge amount of flash on both sides of the cloak in the molding process. So I think partly my trimming up has oh, okay. increased the error and right. the whole just didn't sit together tightly knitted together. There's, there's, a, there's a small enough gap where you, you can see it in the right light. Um, but it, I don't know, it's also really awkward to get to because obviously it's curved and you can't right. get a blade in there. You can't really get a file in there. Um, now, Any ideas on dealing with that? Um, the uh, the Games Workshop mold, do you, uh, the molding tool, you know, the for line the scraping the mold lines, yeah. that tool is actually really good for something like that because the end of it has got this little rounded end, but it's still mm -hmm. really sharp, and it can cut. It'll be able to scrape that groove and wear that down. Um, now, is, is was it a glue join uh, joint pine? Yeah, it's, it's glue joint, so it's um, standard plastic cement uh, joined the two, so it's joined. You did, yeah, you didn't well. use super glue, did you? No, 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 not super glue. Yeah, it's, uh, okay. Poly cement. <laughs> so. Yeah, so you should you should be able to use a tool like that to scrape that mold line and try and create some uniformity there. Yeah. Um, it, it would it will require a bit of work if you had a Dremel, you know, at a low RPM, you yeah. probably could. Um, like a rotary tool, and you know you can probably bring that down a bit, mm. and then get very carefully, you know, with an emery board or whatever, just file that down, nice and smooth. Um, if you're really confident with your razor skills, you can just you know simply shave it down. But I mean, normally what I use um, is a blade like that. I mean, I probably right now see that. that's that, pretty I, good, but not quite right for this it, job. I think. Did it have a curved uh, corner to it, or was it a straight corner? Uh, it's a curved corner. It's it curved? Um, yeah, that should be able to do the trick for you. If you just hold that perpendicular to that surface and yeah. drag it along, you should be able to get a good, um, clean curvature out of that. I, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't quite tell from where the... Uh, when Sorry, you I see if the uh, picture comes up of uh, number 15 Swan Morton blade. Yeah. Yeah, it's got a bit of a curvature to it. Yeah, that should yeah. that should be fine. You just, you just hold that and you, uh, perpendicular to that surface, and just just pull that mold line down. Just treat it like a, a really stubborn mold line, you know. Yeah. And just very carefully, just shave it down, shave it down. Um, just, you know, work at it slowly because you know if you mess up, you know, you, it's kind of hard to build back up unless, of course, you got like you know, you go in with like some um, green stuff or you know modeling putty, something like that, just to kind of rebuild that gap back up. Um, I wouldn't use liquid green stuff. Liquid green stuff shrinks, and I don't yeah. really care for that for filling in gaps or you know trying to correct any of these little errors. I prefer to use something like um, modeling putty. I like Vallejo's uh, modeling putty. It's really good. Yeah. It's, it's made from marble dust. It's really good for for that small little gap filling and you know even just correcting bumpy surfaces. It's really good for that as well because it's such cool. a fine, fine, uh, consistent. Uh, Material, just what it's oh, made of. And it like the um, liquid plastic stuff they do is it a different? Yeah, the pla yeah they sell it as plastic putty or modeling putty. It yeah. just comes in the little bottle, and you just squirt a little bit onto your palette and just scrape it onto your model, and you know you can shape it around. You can use water uh, sometimes to smooth it out. I'll use like my synthetic brushes, a little bit of water dampness to them, and just smooth mm. the putty out onto the surface, and it works great. Uh, I just recently did that for the uh, Harlequin Solitaire. Uh, just covering up some of the mold lines because I didn't really feel like scraping them because yeah. the model is just, it's so uh, delicate 
at its little pivot points and stuff like that. Like, I, I, there's a little gem on his ankle. I snapped it like twice, just handling the model. Yeah. And you know, I'm usually pretty good for handling delicate models. And yeah, I snapped it twice and it irritated wow. the hell out of me. And I do it, like the look of the new Harlequins. I uh, yeah. Nice, yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, I know the Games Workshop. As soon as I saw the Har- as soon as I saw the Harlequin pictures, like the sneak preview stuff, I knew yeah. Games Workshop was gonna, was going to get my money. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those ones. I mean, I have to confess, I've never really been a fan of Eldar, but coming back to the hobby of the Dark Eldar stuff, that was just like wow, yeah, that really cool. And I mean, yeah. the new Eldar, it's like you know what. I actually quite like the look of it. Something's changed. <laughs> like, you know, the, the uh, in third edition, when they came out with the Dark Eldar, like a proper Dark Eldar army, Yeah. you know, like the models, they were passable. They were all right. There was a few that were really cool. You know, uh, Vec on his carrier, you know, that was pretty cool. The Incubi were sculpted pretty cool. You know, like everything was all right. But with the new version of them all, oh yeah, they're just awesome looking. And they're, they're and they, they really really fit the universe very well i think in my opinion and like that new bomber for the dark elder that's so cool looking yeah yeah the uh what's it called void raven void raven yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah, such I a cool was, looking so i was like that seriously tempted me to start a dark elder on <laughs> <laughs> well i've got 20 years of unfinished blood angels to uh, <laughs> yeah what arm what are yeah i didn't even ask what armies yeah. do you play oh um Basically, I play mainly Blood Angels. Yeah. Um, I've done since second edition. I mean, I've actually got the first mini I ever painted here. It's uh, oh really embarrassingly bad. Okay, well you got you got to send me a picture of that too. Uh, I've got some uh, pictures, but yeah, I've le- at least learned how to stay within the lines. So. <laughs> well, you know what? I, like, oh man, like, as a confident booster, I really wish I could show people my first painted model because it's complete crap, and it like. It looks like the kind of thing that you give your, your nine-year-old kid, you know. Uh, go yeah. ahead and give it a shot, you know. Your five-year-old, uh, go ahead and give it a shot, you know. Because, yeah, my first model was bad. And I really wish, you know, just, just to help some of you guys out there, you know, that, you know, like, well, I can't paint this good and, you know, stuff like that. Like, no, no, it's it's all practice. It's all repetition. And, you know, I really wish I could show people my first model because I'm sure a lot of people's confidence would get boosted just just from showing somebody how crap I was when I first started doing this. Yeah. I think that would be actually a good thing to put on the forum or something on Mini Wargaming would be the um, Ben and Now Fred. You know, yeah. show, us your first, show us your current standard or something. That would, I think, inspire a lot of people. Well, I, I kind of like, like, see, I like with Way the Brush, I like people sending in, you know, the early works. Yeah. And then, you know, as we progress through this, You'll you'll see more work in progress, and you'll see that the person's gotten better, and you know, and I, I like that. I mean, I I like seeing people get better. I like helping people. And I mean, I've got um, my current work in progress is a the Salt Squad, and I'm not sure how well this is showing up under this lighting, but I got better uh, photos with better lighting, which I'll send on. Um, but essentially, I really liked the um, look of the uh, what's it called. The, you know, the mini rule book that came in um, oh, yesterday, yeah. but a very sort of stylized Blood Angel on it. Here it is. Yeah. That one. It's, uh, so I say, I think like, I'm trying to sort of go for a, I don't know, I'm not striving for realism or realistic <laughs> highlighting. It's kind of more of a comic style. Yeah. Um, or of an illustrated. Think, yeah, illustrated. That's, that's, that's what it is. Get a bit of that sort of style, I think, because it's, I don't know, I. If it's a, a kind of, um, I mean, I'll send you photos of my uh, Vindicator I painted up a, oh, look at that. a while back. It's, uh, it's the one which, um, yeah, you were saying to use a, uh, a sponge for yeah. the damage effects. Because and... you were initially having trouble with the de- uh, the transfers with that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that all got sorted out with the um, Vallejo um, Deco Fix and Deco Medium. Yeah, I remember that, that. That's amazing stuff. I mean... God, yeah, one of the best <laughs> best lotions and potions I've um, spent money on. I mean, you know, explaining to a significant other that the main medium isn't expensive water. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's not that bad. It's, it's, she, uh, it, it, it works well with their line of paints. I have, I, you know what? I have not tried the main medium with um, like Reaper paints or anything like that, or Vallejo's paints. I have not tried it yet because I only ever use 
their mediums with their paints. I've never really, well, no, I've, I've, I've thinned GW color with Vallejo medium, but I've never gone the other direction. I have to try it, see what kind yeah. of, how the paint reacts. It's not, it's not going to be explosive or anything like that, I know, but, you know, just see how they play together. I mean, that's, that's a good question, actually. Is it actually possible to brush paint um, Vallejo's model air range? Yes. Because I've tried, I think, on some... I've basically found some unpainted miniatures from before I um, sort of fell out in favour with the hobby. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a Space Marine um, Scout Squad and tried painting them. It just comes out so patchy and variable in colour, but I've... Well, of, it's of it's layers and it just gets darker in certain areas and what you know just doesn't build up in others on say like a show. It's style. it's because it's because it's it's really thin and mm. like it's designed for the airbrush. But for a lot of painters out there, where we're really thinning our colors down and you know we're doing glazes and things like that, that's where a lot of painters prefer those air model air colors like the airbrush yeah. colors because because we're already working with the paint in such a thin consistency and yeah like you when you're you're noticing like when you're laying a base color of like red down on top of your white or black primer you yeah. know you're you're seeing that under prime really makes it look really blotchy and stuff and that's because yeah you you do have to lay up like three four layers down depending on which way which color you know you're laying on top of another so like if you're yeah. going a light color on top of a dark you got to lay a lot down and if you're going with a dark color on top of a really light color then yeah you still have to lay a couple layers down um it, that's that's just the nature of those paints they're really really thin and they're they're designed that way but a lot of painters like that because again it's you it allows you to build a very smooth um base layer uh with those colors but of course you do have to apply it you know three four times and that is yeah that's just the par for the course kind of thing it's it, you're not you're not it's it, you're, like you what you're seeing is not uh un, uncommon that's that's a very common thing mm. to notice that yeah it, putting one layer of you know vallejo you know black on top of white and it looks blotchy that's common that's yeah it's just because it's so thin and you do have to apply many layers. But that's what you want to do because you want to have a smooth layer underneath. I mean, I think, I think now I've got my airbrush. I think it's just more <laughs> a case my patience dictates so I blast it through the airbrush. Well, with the airbrush too, I would definitely recommend practicing on something else. I'd, I'd work, yeah. like the best way I would work, um, and I kind of did it myself too, I guess, because when uh, work on larger stuff first and then work your way small. Yeah, I've actually got a drop pod on uh, earmarks for that very purpose, but at the same time I figured I can just as easily, uh, rather than use something like Games Workshop's paint thrower, the um, little hand flamer, right. uh, well not even airbrush really, I say it's a paint thrower, uh, I figured I'd use the airbrush currently mainly for base coating and it's, uh, or something again, you know, if you're doing Blood Angels, you paint it red so it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's all good. But, uh, yeah, I definitely would recommend starting off something bigger. Um, and when you're getting used to the uh, how the air flows and how the paint flows, uh, I definitely would recommend, uh, you know, practice like on a um, grayscale piece of cardboard or something like that, so something mid-tone or white even cardboard, yeah. and just kind of practice how the paint flows out of the brush and how you can th like how thin you're working with it and, you know, what colors you're using, uh, just to get, you know, used to how it works because... Again, as you get into paint, uh, working with the airbrush, sometimes that needle gets dry and the paint yeah. collects on the end of it and that'll throw it off. And it's, so then your tendency is to, okay, well, I'll open the, the, uh, the nozzle up more to let more air and paint flow. And all of a sudden, bang, just like a you know, clogged up you know, uh, pipe, it all comes yeah. flying out and it'll all come hitting your model. And there's nothing worse than just oversaturating an area with color. Yeah, yeah, I've got a, a shoulder pad on. I'm not at all happy with. I've noticed a massive run on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Out. So it, it, it does happen, and so yeah, it's it's with the airbrush. You know, it is about mastering the control that flow mm. and you know how paint f travels through the brush and yeah, it's, a, it's a, she's a completely different beast that you it have is, to master. A lot of fun, so much fun. I am really <laughs> enjoying it. But yeah. So, what, 
once you start getting into it, it's it's really great for getting into like the OSL and zenithal highlighting and you know all that. Oh, it's just all these things I want, I want to try and I'm going too dry basically. So, <laughs> I mean, oh, the only other the only other annoyance I've now got is that I don't know if you ever did this when we had the old hexagonal um, pots yep. of paint. I, I saw a couple. The colour on the top and write it, so you could actually just look down at your box of paints and go, "That's the one I want." Yeah, I did that with, do the... that with the new ones. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they look they look nice enough, but you can't write on the top or colour them in. <laughs> yeah, especially with the dries. The dries don't move. Yeah. So yeah, it's just yeah. I don't know. It's, I've got to find a new way of storing my paints now because they all need to be stored horizontally so I can read what they are. <laughs> 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 well, there's a few yeah, companies yeah. out there who are producing racks, and they're like clear resin. They do that CNC. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, everybody's doing CNC these days. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of my electronic side projects is a um, a well CNC milling machine attachment from a Dremel. Yeah. So I can print out things. Yeah, that'd sure be cool. What, yeah. Squares. <laughs> have you have you looked into the 3D printers? Yeah, yeah, I've looked into them, but I mean, I don't know. I know it's it's interested it's in cutting than laying. It's, <laughs> it's it's a hard sell to the old lady, I'll tell you. Well, three D printers, I think, were for for the old lady. So it's, <laughs> but it's, it's more. I think I've got more of an idea for building a um, plastic card printer, so I can print into plastic card and just pop things out and glue them together. Yeah, it's yeah. been really good for making terrain, actually, uh, repeatable stuff. You know. Yeah. Does, yeah. Exactly. So I got some. Oh, found a very separated, um, enchanted blue. <laughs> <laughs> Still sealed. <laughs> it it almost yeah, it almost looks like uh, it's painted that way. Yeah. It looks like a, somebody painted like the. One of those candles you get are of a different. Color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. That's very yeah. cool. Very old. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I look into storing my paints differently. I mean, just, I think the ultimate solution won't exist because you're always going to have different companies, different pot sizes. I mean, they've got Tamiya paint, which is entirely different size and yeah, yeah, to everything else, and Humbrol paints and uh, and the thing, and the thing is, is like with the Vallejo, they they're really bad for that separating the pigment and mm. medium, and so I am I'm in the habit of like rotating the entire collection of them. <laughs> Well, with, with, even with the agitation in them, uh, yeah. they they still sit really heavily. Like if they, if they're gonna sit for like you know weeks, then I have the I have a whole process where I just turn them all over, so that just gravity just you know I mean just keeps everything mixing and uh, it's such a pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I say that's probably one of the best tips I think I've ever heard, and that was from you as we um, get some BBs and uh, chuck them in your pots of paint. So. Yeah, that's makes such a difference to any metallics definitely yeah. yes it's metallics is definitely any metallic lines yeah they definitely need an agitator in them uh and it, it basically everything else now games workshop colors i mean like because they're such a thick body paint um it's almost like they don't really need it because the paint doesn't separate from itself the paint is designed you know to just sit there and i think they i think they do it on purpose so that they know that their paints can sit on shelves for a long time and yeah. you know not get all gunked up and yeah, but oh, twenty years and it will do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, gravity will work. <laughs> yeah, anybody, anybody of any age can attest that gravity will have its pull on you. <laughs> well, Tim, it was great talking with you today. Um, was there any other kind of questions you had for me? Um, I think I'm pretty much all right with questions. Uh... <laughs> Well, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll. I'll probably sing some more and send yeah. them in. For the uh, brush. <laughs> any any parting words of wisdom you want to leave with anybody? Now's your time. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe my screen froze for a second there. You were sitting there real quiet, like. <laughs> no, I can't think of any words of wisdom. No. Come on, nothing. Listen to Chris. He knows what he's on about. <laughs> <laughs> usually, usually. <laughs> Sometimes I do have off days, where I I just. I sound like an idiot as I'm trying to sputter out what I'm trying to say, but yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll end her there. I think we had a good, good talk. We learned a lot. Um, so yeah, it was great talking with you, Tim. Uh, yeah, awesome. you, Chris. Um, and I am just going to do my spiel and yeah. And so that's Tim, AKA knack Chack. 
It was a great little conversation we had today. I think we learned a little bit about him. But the man, the uh, the myth, is Knack Chack a myth? You, you can answer. You're still on. I don't know. Um, probably. <laughs> 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 if you want to sit down have a conversation in the description below is my skype handle we'll set up a time you know and you know we'll, we'll talk we'll, we'll talk about everything and everything under the sun no holds barred um unless of course we get into a debate and then you know it gets ugly but then again i mean that might be even fun too i mean you know it's not about you know everybody saying oh chris you're such a great guy and blah 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 you know there could be somebody out there who goes you know chris you're full of it and i want to you know I'm calling you out on something. So, you know, that, that's all fine, too. I mean, it's all good. It's all good. So, we'll see you in the next episode of Conversations Way of the Brush. See you later.